the two people Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I know it's past four o'clock. I really need to apologize. Simba is running slightly late. Um, so hopefully we'll start in the next five minutes. Can you?
So while we're waiting for Simba to be here, please can we move forward a bit, please? We need to occupy all the seats in front before we start. Can we move forward, please? Toim. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Okay, let me start by apologizing. We're about seven minutes late, um, but we'll start, start off immediately. Um, so welcome, everyone, to the HH Knowledge Sharing Session. Um, today's topic focuses on leadership. We can't overemphasize the importance of leadership, so we'll keep speaking about it because we know it's a topic that, you know, is important to us within the group, so we have to keep speaking about it, okay? So we have our facilitator today, the CEO of Avon HMO, Simba Okiri. She'll be speaking to us about leadership blind spots. Please, let's welcome Simba. Thank you very much, Simba. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, please, could you move that thing? Yeah, it's a pleasure to be speaking here today, even though the hall is half empty. Very unusual. I'm not quite sure. And I thought people actually used to enjoy hearing me speak. I might be losing my touch. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics, actually, leadership. And reading this book was such a pleasure. Um, in many ways, also, reminders that were, um, I wouldn't say painful, that caused painful memories, but I mean, there were many things there that made me look back on my journey. And as I share what the key learnings are, I will personalize it as much as I can, because I'm aware that you know many people would find it useful. And um, I also invite people to also please, you know, engage at certain um, points within the presentation, so it can really, really be a rich learning experience. So this is the book. It's Leadership Blind Spots, written by Robert Bruce Shaw, and it says, you know. What it aims to do is to help successful leaders identify and overcome the weaknesses that matter. And it's important to you know, note some keywords. So he's talked them all kinds of leaders, but not all leaders are successful. Some start of being successful and then they fail. But every leader will face challenges. And what he's saying in essence is that the ability of a leader to identify the weaknesses that matter the most, recognize those weaknesses, and learn how to make those weaknesses work for him or her is what's really, really important. Now, who remembers this film, Black Swan? Yeah, very, very interesting film. So he tried to, in the beginning of the book, in the introduction, make a distinction between 
blind spots and failures or things that happen to leaders that makes them unsuccessful and distinguished between blind spots and black swans on the one hand and also what he referred to as situational blindness. So he says a blind spot is an unrecognized weakness or threat that has the ability to undermine a leader's success. But then you could also say, but what's, what's a black swan? I mean, how is all this different? The black swan is normally categorized as something huge, catastrophic, unimaginable. You never could have thought it was going to happen. And it has very vast and far-reaching effects. And I mean, I don't know how many people have seen the black swan. I've never seen it. So that's why it is used, I imagine. Because everywhere you go, swans are white. They're these white, beautiful creatures that just float on lakes and ponds. But sighting of a black swan is something that's supposed to be really, really, really rare. Now, one of the great differences between a black swan and what the author calls you know, a leadership blind spot is that there's no amount of analysis you can do that will predict the occurrence of a black swan. You never see it coming. And an example he gave was the internet. <laughs> I don't think many businesses could have foreseen the internet and what it would do to the world and to business and to how we all live our lives. So that's an example of a black swan. He also made a distinction between a leadership blind spot and situational blindness. Trying to understand the difference between a black swan and situational blindness was a bit you know, hard for me because I thought, you know, situational blindness, if you're really aware, should you be blind, you know? Shouldn't you be able to imagine all the situations that could possibly happen? And then you will not be blindsided. But what he said really is that the environment at that point in time makes it impossible for you to see what is going on. That sometimes there are occurrences that happen that come like a fog or a cloud and you cannot see what is going on inside the environment. And the fog or the blackness comes not as a result of anything you could also have predicted. So he gave the example of, let's say for instance, you know, there's a product you're gonna launch and it's so unusual and it's so, you know, um, it's never been done before. Normally you would have data that tells you, in fact, <laughs> what am I saying, my industry? <laughs> the situation of blindness in my industry. Because as Nigeria, we do not have the kind of actual data that other countries do. We don't have data on population health in this country. We have very scanty data. So there are many assumptions that we make as a company that actually is based on situational blindness. That's why we run away from ensuring people over 60. You know, there are just some areas where there's no data that we can go on. So that is the example of situational blindness. Now, leadership blind spot can occur on four levels. The first area of blind spot is self. A leader might not have the right level of self-awareness. So a blind spot might exist in how the leader sees himself and how the leader sees his or her impact on other people around. This is a very, very common one. You think how everybody likes you, you are warm, you are outgoing, but you also don't know you're overbearing and don't listen. And that people laugh a lot because they are afraid of not laughing. <laughs> I said I was going to throw in some personal stories. This, this was a great one for me, a painful experience for me. Earlier on in my career, I was, I lacked self-awareness about in particular my impact on others. I've always loved writing, so you know, and emails came in the middle of my career. There were emails before. We used to have to write memos with hand. You should have seen me writing nasty emails that time. At that time, I didn't know they were nasty, but I, I was also a lawyer, which really didn't help. So when I had to address anybody and I got to my laptop, or well, computer desktop as it was in those days, and I start typing, ha! <laughs> the recipients at the end of that email will know he has received something. 
But in my own mind, I was only doing my job. I was stating the facts. I was being analytical. I was, you know, giving feedback. I was being forthright. I was honest. I don't, I don't, I don't do hypocrisy. Very, very self-righteous little girl. Even though I was not a little girl, but I mean, I had no idea until a certain time when um, I was actually heading a department by then, not a division, but a department. And um, at a meeting, at a departmental meeting with um, the chief marketing officer who headed all of us, you know, somebody said something about me and he, he, he stood up and he started saying, I think I know more than anybody else. And, you know, this is your emails, this is your emails, this is your emails. Somebody needs to talk to you about your emails. And I could not believe the level of hostility and animosity. And what shocked me was nobody spoke to my defense. Nobody. Meaning they were all in agreement about my emails. So I thought I was a go-getter who was a high flyer, who was all these things, but I had no idea the impact of the kind of tone and language I was using was having on the recipients. They could all have been, in fact, not they could all have been, they were all factually correct. And I thought I was doing the organization a great favor by pointing out these things and demanding things be put right and all of that and all of that. But I was totally unaware of my impact on others. The second is teams. How do you view your team as a whole? And how do you view individual members of the team? Eh? Am I still writing emails like that? <laughs> I mean, The same again. Now in our, I mean, really terrible. <laughs> Is it not better? <laughs> so you know, people sometimes have these misconceptions about their teams. Then they're not so fully aware. You think you have a tight, cohesive team that they like each other, everything is going on well, but they hate each other's guts. They hide it when they're with you. But they can't bear to be around each other. They're always finding ways to sabotage what the other person is doing. I'm protecting their turf. But the leader thinks, oh, my team is great. Sometimes the blind spot is also in relation to members of the team. And this is very, 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 you know, it happens a lot. Come on. You think a particular member of the team is the high flyer. You think that's the person that gets all the job done. You think that's one that has the skills and the get-go attitude. His eyes have his own. Everybody else but the leader will know. Sometimes as well, the most divisive member of the team is the one that you think has your back. But that person has your back only when you are there. Has your back only to, you know, to your face the goals you are wanting to achieve and what it will take to bring the team together to help you to achieve those goals. That person is doing the exact opposite. There's also a blind spot on an organizational level. And this is very you know, tightly related to the team level as well. Because sometimes people have a false belief in their organizational efficiency, how their company works, how their company operates, or the culture that is pervasive. The one I'm most scared of is the organizational efficiency one, where you believe you have a claims department that is the best, and then out of a sudden you just see 92 MLR, yay! <laughs> and then you start questioning everything you know. How did the medical loss ratio get to be so bad? What happened? To the, you know. So it's it's it happens. You get complacent. After a few months of everything looking good, you begin to think, yes, I've got it, I've got it, everything is, it's, 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 it's really, really very easy to get blindsided. And then market, the most important one. Well, I don't know that one is more important than the other, but this one is just, you know, when it hits you, it's mass failure. When a leader has so lost sight of who his customers, who his valuable customers are, or who his future customers will be. And he misses the plot entirely. Or what they want, where they are going. Many leaders are so hung up in the past about the customers that made them money before. I've been in an organization like that, where the big multinationals were supposed to be the, the customers that have always made us money. We built this company on these customers. 
by the time we sat down three months and did analysis and brought it to the board, these customers were bleeding the company dry. That's why it's not a black swan. That's why it's not a situational blindness. This one is sheer blind spots. Because the facts were there. The data was there. But because of an inherent belief, they were ignored. So these are the four levels. We're going to go through some examples of leaders that we all know about or we've heard about where each type of this blind spot led to serious failures for them. Before we go into that though, I want us to bear four things in mind. Is that blind spots are not all bad. Very often, that very thing that is our greatest strength is also our greatest weakness as leaders. Every overpowering strength has an associated blind spot. Think of it as a mirror that's convex on one side and concave on the other. And there's some examples. Extremely passionate leaders very often don't sweat the small details. And the devil is in the detail. Sometimes very passionate leaders so fall in love with what they are doing. And you find this often, you know, in IT, product development, people fall in love with the ability to create and innovate. They get very passionate about that. And they are blinded to, does anybody even want to pay for what I'm building or what I'm creating? How is they going to bring money out? You also have visionary leaders who get so caught up in their vision of the future and what they want to do that they silence all dissenting views and all contrary opinions. Many parts of the book gives examples of why this is a tricky balance. Because leaders who don't have that level of high belief in themselves can often not achieve what it takes to break new territories and be pioneers. The very thing that makes them successful can also be the very thing that brings them down and leads to their greatest failures. And we'll see through the examples. Also, highly analytical leaders who like facts and figures, who want, I'm not describing myself, they are unable, apparently, to inspire and motivate. That's not me. <laughs> Because they're so dry. They don't catch fire. People can't catch fire around them. Also, awareness of a blind spot doesn't mean it disappears. Obviously, my email is still an issue with that and <laughs> then. But it's work in progress constantly, you know. But um, Blind spots, even though they are inevitable and can be dangerous, they can also be adaptive and they can serve a leader well. So they gave the example of Tom Watson Senior, who started IBM. His son said he remembers when you know his father came to their house and told his mom, swept his mom off her feet and said he's decided to rename their company International Business Machines. At this point, all they were doing was punching holes in paper. It was a mom and pop shop in the garage. And he thought to himself, how on earth, what kind of unrealistic dream is this man having? But what the author is saying is that if you look at every visionary leader that has achieved great things, they had this illogical belief. An illogical belief that was so strong, no matter what obstacle they came across, they never for one minute doubted that they were on the right path. Same thing with Ford. Everybody else used to make fun of him when he started building cars. And he tried and he failed and he tried and he failed and he tried and he failed. But later we will also see how these very, very strong traits contributed to the downfall of some of these great leaders that we've spoken about. Now, we're going to be discussing leadership and leaders and their failures. But the author also wanted to point out that we need to balance it with an appreciation of the kind of pressures that leaders face. 
that focusing on failures and shortcomings without appreciating their higher motives and the obstacles they constantly face every day in order to achieve what they do will be doing them a great disservice. So in as much as we will point out our fingers to leaders who have failed and why they fail and why we should allow fingers to be pointed to us as leaders as to what we are feeling at and what we are not seeing, please let's remember that the author is asking us to appreciate the greater sacrifices that leaders take and uh, that, that they make and the kind of pressures that they are under. So, Steve Jobs. He's an example of a leader that had serious blind spots about himself. In fact, the people who used to work with him said, you know, he had a reality distortion field. Are any stars of Star Trek in here? No Star Trek fans. Wow. No. <laughs> And they called him this because they said no matter what set of data you presented to him, no matter what other kind of information you gave him, he will twist it to fit what he wanted to do initially. He could distort reality to support whatever vision or goal he had set for himself and how he wanted to do things. You might say, okay, so that was an area of blind spot for him or that was an area of weakness for him. But also, you have to remember that his famous quote, that only the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who eventually do. He wanted to work with the crazies. He believed he himself was a crazy. Every genius has to have an element of craziness. So in Steve Jobs, we find the strength, and we find that same strength a weakness and a blind spot. And it was so bad for him. We all know what happened. He brought in Scully, found Scully to be a challenge, and was confident that he could convince the board to kick Scully out, not knowing that he had fully alienated the entire board. So who ended up being kicked out? Blind spot, lack of self-awareness. But how do we then do it? Should we? Try and leverage the strengths and minimize the downsides of blind spots? Or should we try and change the fundamental nature of leaders? Because, I mean, a school of thought would say, look, we know that's where he's weak. We know that's where, you know, blah, 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 blah. Let's just kind of work with him in spite of his limitations. Because if we try and change the core, then we lose that visionary, passionate, go-getting kind of leader that we want. You know, people say we should respect and it's, it's funny the way they put it, the precarious ecology of their delusions. <laughs> it's almost as if a psychiatrist wrote that. Because you know, you, you want to manage, what this is saying is that, yeah, you want to keep those, their ideas intact and then manage the external surrounding while not um, savaging their core. Because that's who they are. If you take that away, what is left? But in spite of that, though, every single leader should learn how to temper his or her own excesses. And that's what Steve Jobs did. That's why his story turned around. Because by the time he came back to Apple again, he had learned from his experiences in Pixar and the other places where he'd been to surround himself with very strong-willed people. Strong-willed people who are not afraid to push back. And who he knew would protect him from himself. That's what happens when leaders begin to get self-awareness about their blind spots. To go back to my email, some of those emails, Adim, I actually asked three people in my office to read it before I send it. <laughs> yes, uh, who are my favorite male readers? They are here in this room. You know? So um, Self-awareness, like we said before, doesn't make the blind spot go away or the weakness. It just makes you conscious of it. And when you are conscious of it, you learn as a leader to begin to mitigate it and put things in place so that its impact and its effect will not be negative. And if it's negative, it will not be negative on a large scale. This is a less famous man. Who knows who he is? 
Jamie Demon, CEO of JP Morgan. Before JP Morgan, he'd ended, he's headed many, many other financial institutions in the city in London, was very famous. But guess what? Under his watch, a rogue trader made a loss of $6 billion in the space of a few weeks or a few months. What made it worse was that when the news started happening, coming out, his executives told him there was nothing much to worry about. It didn't have that much of an impact. So he called the press conference and said exactly that. So by the time the figures were tallied and it came up to $6 billion, he received such a bashing. But JP Morgan was a huge, huge financial institution. There's no way the CEO will know every trader or know every asset or know what was going on like six levels below him. And that is why this is about blind spots about the team and the company. Not seeing the threats, making incorrect assumptions about the company's culture, its processes, and its people. Because he assumed, actually, there was another player that's important to talk about. Her name was um, uh, Ina Drew, a woman who was supervising this trader. She was a chief investment officer. Very highly respected, highly regarded. Proud to this time, her own department alone was contributing a third of J.B. Morgan's profitability worldwide. She had an impeccable track record. Assets she controlled was about 350 billion that she was responsible for. But under her watch, rogue trader. So the CEO said, well, I relied on the system to work. I relied on the people to do what they were meant to do. And I, we had a culture of openness and transparency. I believed it would come out, blah, 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 blah. But it didn't. So he had to come out again publicly afterwards and acknowledge that it was a failure of the kind of processes, the kind of people, and his assumptions were wrong. And he really did believe that this woman was more capable and talented than she really was. Because people had come to him to say, look, this area of trading or this type of trading is very soft, very new. Yes, she's an old, reliable, you know, uh, what's it called? Capable chief investment officer. But things have become so advanced and complex. It's beyond, it's like me now saying I want to do digital marketing. It's not my time. You know, I can give strategy direction at the top. I can do many things. But on the ground, I don't really know what is happening. Why do you place the Google ad in this one and not that one? Why should, you know, I need them to tell me. If a leader does not acknowledge that there are people being put in charge of responsibilities that don't have the required level of skills and experience. And even if they don't, then that means you need to strengthen the checks and balances around the person who is on the ground actually carrying out these activities. And that is what this guy failed to do. What came out also was that inevitably, the larger and more complex an organization is, the more likely it is that the leaders at the top will be insulated from the truth. Because nobody wants to build the cat. When the first one billion loss happened, who was going to go and tell him that one billion loss had happened? So they were all covering it and trying to, when we trade it, we'll get it back. We just have to keep trading. We would, we would get it back. We would get it back. So he didn't know. In organization, hierarchies can work in ways that will keep critical information away from the people that need to know. The more layers, the more likely it is that the leader does not know. Learning point here is that leaders have to put in place mechanisms to prevent the filtering and distortion of information across boundaries and level. And this very often means entrenching an informal culture of some sort, in addition to the formal processes, documents, etc., and systems. Because the informal structure or the informal, I don't know, you know, culture rather, not structure, will throw up information faster. and your regimented processes and documentation and blah, 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 and blah, blah. So this is one of the instances when lack of awareness about specific team members, in this case, um, uh, Drew, who was the chief investment officer, 
and also lack of awareness about the organizational culture that was in place and how efficient their own operations was at identifying risks and mitigating against them. This is a familiar face. I've mentioned his name like three times already. Tom Ford. Henry Ford. <laughs> Tom Ford is a designer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing to do with how I look. <laughs> you know, he was a visionary man. He brought us the motor vehicle at a time when everybody else laughed at him. He, you know, was against all kinds of obstacles and against all odds, he created this industry. He pioneered this motor car industry. But the market changed. Other competitors started bringing off different kinds of cars. General Motors also was the first to introduce cars with a financing option so more people could afford to buy it. People were not just satisfied with just a vehicle that could move them from here to there. They wanted wheels, bells and whistles and all of that. Henry Ford wasn't budging. In fact, it was so bad apparently that the only member of his management team and no, nobody else had the courage to come up to him and tell him that the company was declining so fast that what he built was going to be ruined. They could all see it was going to be ruined, but nobody could tell him. The one man that came to tell him, he used to humiliate him at the meetings and finally he fired him. Apparently it was his wife that convinced him to finally step down. His visionary nature was also his undoing. Because he believed so much in the correctness of his vision that how dare they question it can they see what he has achieved? When everybody else was wrong, he was the only one that was right. But that was how many years ago? Success increases the likelihood that a, dinner, a, a leader will deny reality. Because when you've been successful in a particular way for so long, you begin to believe that that is the way you want to silence all opposing views, all of, you know, anything that doesn't tally with what has worked. Makes people cling on to a market, you know, model that is not relevant anymore, a business model that is not relevant anymore, and a market that has since moved in another direction. Now, This success thing is a blessing and a curse. All the three leaders had at least one blind spot that was really, really bad. They were all different from the other, but all of them had equally catastrophic eff effects on the companies that they led and on their own trajectory as well. Steve Jobs, his blind spot was in his lack of self-awareness. The demon trap was his blind spot about his team, his team members, and his company. Henry Ford was about the market. A leader and therefore a company's success very often is the very same thing that sets it up for failure. That's the danger with blind spots. That's why I said it's almost like a mirror one side is concave. A concave, the other side is convex. Because by nature, people seek to replicate what has worked in the past. Also, the more successful companies are more highly resourced. They've been making profit since. So they're sitting on quite a hefty, you know, reserve. So they're insulated. The fact that they often tend to be highly profitable, cash-rich companies means they have a buffer. So other things that would have made them wake up won't make them wake up because they're still making money. So it shields them from the mistakes they are making and from the weaknesses that are becoming apparent to everybody else in their market apart from themselves. So success can be the enemy. And I added the good that a tiger can do. That's a very funny thing to add on a slide, but you'll see why I added it again. 
I said the success trap and the good that a tiger can do. A tiger is, is a very, you know, dangerous animal. Who would like to be in a room with a tiger for about six months? <laughs> but you know what, what I want to say is that we should all pray for tigers. No, no, no. We should pray to have tigers around us. I like films. Who remembers this film? Oh, wow. Deep film. Very deep. A psychological film. No shooting and no killing. So, in essence, the young boy was traveling with a ship that had all the animals in a zoo. And there was a shipwreck. And he managed to get on this little boat. And he saw other animals, befriended them. There was a monkey, there was a baboon, there was, I don't know, other kinds of animals. And he befriended those ones. And they were eating whatever scraps of fruits, vegetables was left from the ship. After a while, he discovered there was a tiger hiding under the canvas in the boat. One by one, the tiger killed all the animals until he remained just himself and the tiger. And they were <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, in the ocean. Days turned into weeks. Weeks turned into months. Just this boy and the tiger on this small boat. And the boy adapts and learns ways in which to keep the tiger in check so that he doesn't get eaten. I think he had to drink his urine one time. Figured out how to kill the fish and blah, blah. Sometimes he would throw scraps to the tiger. Him and the tiger were always watching each other. For months in the vast ocean. After a while, he realizes that the tiger is actually what is keeping him alive. Without the tiger and the threat the tiger posed to him, he would probably have perished. What kept his adrenaline pumping? The tiger. It is a tiger that forces him to be vigilant and resourceful. And that made him to be fully aware of his strengths and his limitations. He realizes that the tiger, an adversary that could turn on him at any moment, is also what propels him forward and keeps him alive. We all need tigers as leaders or else our success will make us complacent. So who wants a tiger? Nobody, I want tigers, oh, I always, ah, I, I always aim to have tigers. Yes, yes. I don't think the tiger. Yeah, yeah, it was it was philosophical. The tiger just wanted to eat him. The tigers don't think that far. <laughs> he just he, because he was feeding him scraps. The boy was feeding him scraps. When he killed a fish or ate something, he would throw a bit over to the tiger. You know, so he learned how to maintain a certain balance of power and control between himself and the tiger. And the fact that he constantly needed to be on his toes, he needed to be alert. He that's what kept him alive. Because I imagine if it was just the boy alone in the vast ocean like this, he would have given up psychologically, he would have died even before death came. I, I kind of want to support everyone. I, I think that, yeah, it's philosophical, but we always assume that wizards are people. Yeah. And I think that the tigers are the ones that are very intelligent. The point is that that tiger would have known that there are two levels. Number one is compassion. So that tiger is conscious that they are the only two living organisms on that boat. So there is um, an innate desire to preserve that other person. Number two is that the tiger can also see that he's exhibiting some skills in manipulating. The tiger wants to survive. Because if um, I think the tiger wants to survive. So just 
Just have it's a, a view. It is a view. The can easily. It will not take him. See if the if the predominant if the predominant instinct is to feed your belly. What is a couple of fish uh, scraps to a tiger? It would have killed him in one day. Okay, so I'm going to assume you didn't watch the film. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the, the truth of the matter is the way we have been taught about wild animals, and I'm no expert, oh, I've only been to the zoo to watch them when they are safely inside a cage, is that, <laughs> is that instinctively a wild animal will hunt and kill. If he has reason to fear for himself, he will withdraw. If he has no need to fear for himself, he will withdraw. Now, certain animals have also been recognized have, have, as having emotional ties, empathy. So we know elephants mourn. We've watched documentary where elephants keep on going back to the place where their mother or their father or their child was buried. I've never seen tiger do that. So I'm not sure. You might be right. I might be. None of us are. It's possible. I don't know. But I mean, th th there's some literature around which animals. But I hear you, because on a spiritual level, you want to believe that every living thing created by God should have some kind of emotional need for uh, another living thing. I, I don't know, but. People have cultivated relationships with animals, and they remember them and they want to Yes, yes. It's, it's people who raise them as cubs. This was a fully grown tiger. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so, I mean, that I was going to say, that was the next one I was going to say that, you know, wild animals who were raised by humans have been shown when they grow older, they remember who raised them, even after they've been released into the wild. But don't forget, this was a wild animal that, you know, never knew this boy as a cub. But I take what you're saying. I mean, we have no way of knowing. What I was seeking to draw from there is that having a present source of danger, constant keeps you on, on, on your toes and prevents you from being complacent. Now, how do you spot blind spots? That's a pun. <laughs> in yourself and in others. This matrix is supposed to help us. And I'll give people a few minutes to read it. And then I'll ask for volunteers who might want to expatiate on it. So there's low and there's high. It's a typical four by four, two by two. And you have known weaknesses, known strengths. You have unknown strengths and blind spots. On one side, you have leader capabilities. On the other side, leader awareness. And you have known to leader and unknown to leader. Who wants to take the first shot? I believe this is why these chairs are here. <laughs> Who wants to make a stab at explaining or you know giving examples of this kind of ex Yes, yes. So for instance, you could say, look, a non-strength you know, that I know that I have is this or that or that, and a known weakness. So this is what I think this part of the box is referring to. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to give everybody the ability to begin to understand where their blind spots could be. Okay, so my example... My example for a known weakness is like knowing that I should be more rounded in some regulatory areas, which I do not know them, but I know in this area, I should know them. So that would, it would even affect my confidence level. Okay. But I, th I am aware that that is a known weakness. Okay. So that is, you know what you don't know. Yes. Excellent. Where is you know what you don't know? Known weakness. Yeah. Okay. Any other one? Um, so blind spot is what I would go for. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So when I got my 360, 
there was something in it that was like, hmm. And I got feedback of, oh, when you play favorites, and you're kinder to your favorite people. And I'm like, wow, that's actually a blind spot because from my own looking glass self, I feel that people who I like, quote, I'm tougher on, but somebody outside of me observing gave the feedback of when you like somebody, you are, what's the word? You are lenient with the person. So it actually was a, it was a total blind spot because people, People that have been close actually said, ah, give me a break, small night. Is it because I'm your friend? So to now hear from another person from outside saying the opposite, it was a complete revelation and one that working on as a leader, like, okay, being more aware. I don't know if that counts. Yes, it does. Because before it was said to you, you didn't know what you don't know. That's what a blind spot is. It's an area that, you know, you have no awareness of. And you have no awareness that you have no awareness. <laughs> That's really what the blind spot is. Thank you. I want to share a known weakness. Um, a known weakness to me is just that um, sometimes I, I talk more than I allow other people to talk. And that's a problem for me. And I wish. I could get over it because I will get more out yes, of people possible. if I if I listen to them and let them contribute more. So anybody that can help me with that weakness, I will welcome. <laughs> but it's also one of your best strengths, and I, I guess that's 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 what this book is really teaching us. That your greatest weaknesses are also the opposite, found in your your best strengths. Okay, I think actually those examples have really helped us. They practicalize this matrix. Is there anyone that wants to say something more about this matrix or ask questions about this matrix? Just a suggestion, because this is for personal. I think it could also tell you projects when you're trying to execute a task. It would help as well. Yeah, what you know about and what could be the possible blind spots on that project, of course. Essentially, the lesson is that for you to have high capability as a leader, you must know your strengths and also know your weaknesses. Then yeah. you are a very capable leader. Yeah. If you know your strengths, but you don't know your weaknesses, Not or you know your weaknesses, or you don't know your strengths, or you know neither of the <coughs> two, then you will be a very poor leader. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I, I can I can give a real example of that one. Um, I always thought I was numerically weak because I was an art student and you know in secondary school, I loved literature, history, Bible knowledge, all those things, and I hated math and physics and chemistry, but I loved biology got an A1 in biology. When the math teacher came in through the door, I would go out through the window. <laughs> I was that bad. Because I decided I was going to read law. Who, did, who needs maths for law, I thought to myself. Well, my father decided that everybody had to have a credit in maths or else you weren't going to university. So even though I was admitted straight out of from five, I didn't go. I had to go retake the maths in November that year, then we still used to do GC in November. You do your normal work in June, and then you take November just in case. So thankfully, the just in case worked for me, and I finally had a C6 in maths. But all my mates, well, some of my mates were already in university. I had to wait one more year. I had to go to low six. But then thankfully, I entered law, and I still did what I wanted. But that left me with a distinct impression that I was poor in maths, that I didn't know maths, and I wasn't numerical. When I started banking in 1991, they would send you on all these courses, financial statements, analysis, all these things that are supposed to turn you from a lawyer into a banker. I dreaded it. As far as I was concerned, I don't know how come I scaled through the trading school 
because every time I saw figures, I had headache. But then I started work, and it kind of, I, I, I guess maybe gradually over time, it was demystified. But even then, I had a honest to God fear of everything calculating, everything that required calculation. I would do it if I needed to, but I always believed that was my weak area, and I, I couldn't abide it. If you forced me, I would do it. But I would do it greeting my teeth and praying all through. I then went to do the Sloan Fellowship at London Business School in 2006, after having worked for about 10 years. And um, of course, you can't, first is GMAT. London Business School is like number three in the world. So your GMAT score had to be way, way, way there. I nearly died. I, I hired a coach who was teaching me maths at home. And I was paying good money <laughs> for this maths because I believe I could never pass it on my own. I passed it, entered London Business School, quaking. All the finance courses, like four, that I would have to do and pass. The first group they put us in, I raised my hand. I said, I want everybody to know I read law. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I read law. And I have two children with me in London I'm looking after. I might not be able to keep up with you guys. <laughs> you know, but hey, I don't know whether I was the professor that took the hardest of the finance classes. All I know is by the time I finished, I was popping. He actually wrote on my script that for everything you said, Sim, but this is a phenomenon. I think I got an A star again or something like that. I couldn't believe it. But I still thought it was because it was academic. It was only subsequently after that I started to realize that actually it was just my mind. So I own it now. It's a strength. It's not even that I'm OK. Don't try me. <laughs> so that's a practical example. It took me almost 15 or 18 years to get it. But finally, I realized it was actually a strength. Not only was I not average, I wasn't, I wasn't weak. I wasn't average. It's actually one of my best areas. My commercial acumen and ability to analyze numbers. Me. <laughs> OK. But I accepted it, and now I own it. So that's an example. Very often we have hidden strengths that we don't know about. Sometimes it takes the right person to unlock it. Sometimes it takes the right challenge to unlock it. But they're there. So degrees of blindness. Because you know, <laughs> there are some people they have two eyes. There are people who have one eye and a half. You know, this is what this one is talking about. So even blind spot has degrees. <laughs> The first, lack of awareness. The leader is thoroughly unaware of the weakness or threat. He's unaware of the vulnerability that is created by his own weakness or by the weaknesses of members of his team or his team as a whole or the organization or the kind of threat that emerging competition activity poses to his business. So he's just totally unaware. The second level of unawareness or blindness is faulty assessment. Yeah, the leader is aware that the weakness or threat exists, but he analyzes it incorrectly. So we've seen the competitor is a global player, has a lot of money, coming in with deep pockets started advertising all over the place. These people are going to take all our customers. What do we do? Sit down, analyze it, and decide, OK, the best thing to do is to start, thank God we didn't do it, start offering hospitals higher tariffs so they can treat our customers better, or our own and release better. And um, medical cost goes up, and we start being unprofitable. As a leader, the threat was seen, but the analysis and the conclusions were wrong. Leader is aware of vulnerability, but doesn't understand its potential impact, or fails to forecast its movement accurately. That's what a faulty assessment is. And then you have failure to act. This is the most tragic. The leader is aware. He can see the threat, he can see the weakness, but he fails to act. You see that he doesn't possess the resolve. And this, is, this, this, this happens a lot. 
Sometimes leaders know what needs to be done, but they can't bring themselves to do it. Maybe there's an economic downtown, a downturn. There's recession. You can see margins have shrunk. You can see that the business as itself is not going to be sustainable at the size you are carrying on, and you need to shrink. But that ability to take the hard decision, to lay off people, close down certain plants, review the wide area of products you are offering, reduce them. The resolve to take those kind of hard decisions is not there. That's failure to act. Sometimes it's even skills that makes leaders fail to act. You've seen this, the, the threat, you've seen the weakness. You can see what is happening in your company, that the culture is a divisive culture. The culture is something that is pulling everything you have built down. But you believe that it's something that you can fix internally. Not recognizing that you individually don't have the skill set. Maybe the leadership within your HR function doesn't have the skill set either. Calling external people, no. We'll do it ourselves. That might also be an example of not having the skills to take the required action. And most leaders at this point will just justify they are not taking the action by saying that it's not needed. These are the three degrees of blindness. You can see one. There is very plenty room to correct. Because if you make this one aware, he will do his analysis and probably might take the right action. Because the only problem he has is lack of awareness. The second one of faulty assessment. Maybe somebody comes with a superior argument, fresh data, good eye. We'll be able to convince him that his analysis is wrong and show him that based on this your analysis, this and this and this are the possible outcomes. But look, if you add this data set to what you have, it completely disproves your hypothesis. So is there hope or not? There's hope. Please, number three, is there hope? So it's possible actually that one could identify <laughs> lots of blind spots. And how then do you prioritize which ones to deal with first? Because you can't go, you know, dealing with everything immediately. A good way to think about it is that this particular weakness of threat, if it's not addressed, how much of a serious harm will it cause to me or to my organization? And the enormity of the likely impact is what should help to prioritize which blind spots to start working on and which ones to put further down the list. Another way is to ask, what if all my beliefs, all my assumptions about the possible impact of this threat or weakness is incorrect? Can I live with the consequences of what will happen? Because certain times, you know, we take decisions every day, big decisions, small decisions. But some decisions have further reaching effects than others. So the possible impact of the decisions we take around these threats and weaknesses should help us to prioritize which ones are the most urgent and pressing blind spots that we need to address. So how do you identify your own blind spots? Number one, review your mistakes for reoccurring weaknesses. For many of us, we've had careers that would span over five years, eight years, 12 years, 10 years, 20 odd years, 30 years. I know there are some mistakes I keep seeing. Thankfully, in the past, more recent years, I've seen them less and less frequently. But if I make five mistakes over the course of two years, I know for sure some three that will be there, that five. I know them. We all need to do that level of self-analysis. Because those mistakes, we often see patterns in them. Another way of identifying 
blind spots for oneself is to solicit feedback from people who have insights about you. And you have to choose those people carefully because you don't want to ask psychophants. You also don't want to ask people who have personal biases already. You want impartial feedback. In fact, maybe you should even ask all of the above and one will eliminate the other or dilute the effect of the other. I'm not sure, but I know that I would try as much as possible to ask that feedback from as diversified a pool as possible. So ask the feedback within your personal space. The feedback is not just for pairs that you work with or subordinates that report to you or people who you report to. Ask your husband, ask your brother, ask your sister. Ask your friends. Ask people who you know the success or failure of your life will impact them because they are invested in you being a success. And then it says complete the leadership blind spot survey. So let me take those one by one and talk a bit more. When you review your mistakes, you have to ask yourself these questions. What are the most significant mistakes I've made in my career? And what caused each of these mistakes? Being unaware of the impact of my own actions, communications, has been a recurring thing for me. In fact, I had an older woman once told me that um, the person who defecates doesn't remember. I'm sure very deep things to do. But without shame. Because I know somebody in this room is going to learn from it. That the person who defecates doesn't remember is the person who packs it. Simple, you defecate without looking back. <laughs> I didn't leave me now. <laughs> it's in your bow. <laughs> I've never forgotten. Never. There's another really scary one to that has been said to you before. When you are leaving, doesn't mean you have to put on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> that, because, that because you are leaving doesn't mean you need to defecate on the chair. But those things stay with you. And you know some people really who do yes. things that. that and the person who told me this was not in my work environment, guys. But the way she said it, the way she said it, the context in which she said it, made me think back to other instances of stuff that happened in my work environment. It made a lot of sense. It confirmed what I already knew. And, the, and this was after that experience I had. That everybody, when they talk about my email, everybody was in agreement. Nobody spoke for me. I thought, Kai, you mean this thing is still with me? This is like five years after, and I thought I had moved, I thought I had really, really, you know, defeated it. Uh, I've gone even beyond, I've gone beyond that. I've gone beyond that. And you only send a mail after you have resolved to recap the resolution. Excellent. I, I practice that. Um, another thing also is that I just draft the mail and I never send it. I draft the mail and I feel good I've drafted my loyalty mail. And then I press save. But once in a while, my mi mistake. <laughs> once by mistake, I spent 10 and nearly died. And it could not be recalled. But thankfully, it was also a person with whom I had shared my problem in this area. So he was very forgiving. <laughs> and he understood. And when I showed him all the others I had saved that I'd never said, say, can you this girl? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, those are, I mean, honestly, Tony, that's just a wonderful example. Because those are the things that save. 
being able to know that this is an issue and then consciously in fact if truth be known i distrust myself the time i feel compelled most to send an email i will die first if i send it i distrust my instincts when it comes to writing in the heat of the moment because i know no matter how and a little voice in your head will be telling you symbol write it it's okay <laughs> The situation demands for it. You need to set things right. Don't listen to that voice, I tell myself. I've heard this voice before, it used to put me in trouble. Save, I will not send it. You know, so, and also, but beyond also recognizing those weaknesses and threats, you have to know what the causes are. And what the causes are, what the triggers are, might also be certain types of people. You've got to know. What are the triggers? Because if you are unaware of the triggers, then you are just fighting surface. You are not going deep. So recognize your triggers. So once you get into an environment that you know this environment, ah, I can see potential triggers. One, two, three, no, it's not me today. You already do like this to say, okay, <laughs> If care is not taking, I will be like this before I know it. So I am going to be very, I will not speak, I will not, whatever. Because you can see your triggers, your enemies, your village people. <laughs> they have gathered. <laughs> so you go there prayerfully, <laughs> and then you, 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 you try and avoid those loopholes. Now, the next thing to ask actually is what... Um, Tony and I just tried to provide solutions to, is what can I do to prevent the mistakes from occurring again? The examples that we shared has to do with the emails, but it can be many things. If you're the kind of person that you know that a certain error or a certain weakness of yours is lack of attention to detail, you will know. That's why when I interview people, I ask, your last appraisal, what did your boss say? The appraisal before that, what was on it? And it's only at that point of interviewing them when they're speaking that they themselves realize, mm, actually, yeah, that's kind of common. Because if we listen, people will have been telling us these things. But what are we going to do to prevent it from occurring and occurring and occurring again? Each person has to know with this, where these areas of weaknesses and threats are coming from, what are the triggers, and what he or she can do to avoid it in the future. If not avoid completely, because another thing this book also says is that the blind spots never go away. They are yours. Own them. Be adaptable to them. Make them work for you. Take cognizance of the threats they represent to your success. So in other parts, be deliberate in your use of them. Don't let them control you. You control them. Number two, solicit feedback. And after having carefully selected the people you want the feedback from, you want to ask them whether they can see any blind spots in how you operate. And be specific. Can they see blind spots in your leadership behavior and the impact it's having on people? Can they see it in the area of your team, how you manage your team and your beliefs about any of your team members? And sometimes when you ask these questions, you really get very frank and insightful and helpful answers. I know I have. Because there have been times when I also had misconceptions about certain team members' abilities and limitations. And it's through feedback that I get to realize, actually, Simbo, that's, that's totally wrong. This person is not really capable of what you are requiring, or that person is more than capable of what you are requiring. Also, the strengths and weaknesses of your company. You can never see it all. People have to tell you. People have to give you insights that your own perspective did not address. And the changing nature of our markets, wow, and the threats we face. I don't know any leader that believes that, you know, they don't have blind spots in this area. This is just full of blind spots constantly have to go on the shop floor, constantly have to seek feedback, even direct from the consumers themselves. In social engagements, in 
you know, in churches, wherever you are meeting people, seek constant feedback about your products, your services, in what area the market is going, what are people willing to pay, why do they think, you know, that your product is good, your product is bad, what challenges do they experience, you know? People just have to keep on doing that. And the third thing to do, buy the book. <laughs> There's a survey inside that is helpful. If you want, you could buy it and then take the survey. So this is a summary. I'm sorry you can't see it. I thought I was being smart by taking the picture <laughs> and attaching the picture, but it's not working. So I'm going to read it out loud. <laughs> So the four types or the four areas of blindness, we've discussed it. Self, it says you are unaware of your impact on others. For example, a team leader might believe that she values team level debate and decision making when in fact she makes the majority of the decisions without giving people an opportunity to get in a word hedgeways. Don't mind this author. <laughs> I thought so myself. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Another blind spot area we've discussed is the team, the capabilities and motives of your teams. You don't see certain members of your leadership team accurately, resulting in performance or behavioral issues. A leader might believe that members of his team are performing at a high level when in fact the group lacks the capabilities needed to lead now. Because maybe the firm is much larger and more complex than it used to be in the past. That's just an example. Another example the book gave also was the one I said earlier where you think you have a really cohesive tight team but meanwhile they hate each other and they are backbiting and they are just protecting turfs and sabotaging each other's work. Then company as well is another area which we've discussed today, the capabilities and culture of the organization. Sometimes leaders will have a very inaccurate view of the organization's culture and ability to execute on the strategies. This is actually very, very important. Because sometimes a leader will believe that, you know, our organization is customer focused, everybody is for the customer. Meanwhile, the heads of departments are only worried about uh, maintaining their own sphere of influence and control and not really looking outside towards the customer at all. Or they're only worried about what do they need to do to get a certain appraisal score or to get a certain outcome so they can qualify for a certain performance incentive. <coughs> That's a mistake that many leaders fall into. Then market is the final one, the area of blindness, trends and competitive threats in the industry. So many leaders don't often see the macro trends evolving in their marketplace or fully understand the consumer's emerging needs. And it might just delude a leader into thinking that his core business is sound, when in fact the market is shifting. And everybody else has seen that there's a requirement for a new model of operation. And he's, him and his company are the only ones that haven't seen it and haven't started to change towards it. This summarizes the four main areas. Um, Simba, we have a question online. OK. Um, so from Peter Shade. OK. I would like to know if the 360 appraisal model can help highlight blind spots. Oh, yes. It's one of the best tools to highlight a leader's blind spots. You know, the 360 appraisal model is excellent for this reason. Because it gives you other people's perspective about yourself. But you see, for blind spots, that only helps in one area. It helps you in the area of self-awareness. It doesn't necessarily help you for the blind, blind spots that relate to your team or your company. It doesn't also necessarily, it might to an extent, it might, it might, because then you can see the views of what other people think about various team members. But organization culture, I guess, will need another kind of survey. What's that one you used to do, Owen? Engagement or something like that. You know, so there are tools, but I'm not sure there's one tool that can do all. Excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so in seeking feedback about your team, um, I mean, what I personally think sometimes is that because other people don't work with your team and you work with your team members, that they may not totally have, you know, the right uh, view and be able to give you real feedback, you know? So other people within the team can, I don't know, maybe yeah. give feedback about other people within the team, but mm -hmm. who can give you feedback about your team as a team? Okay, um, so I would 
use us as an example. The other people who engage with my team would be maybe the actuary, for instance. You see, if there are any other firms, organizations that we as a team engage with, they can see the dynamics between your team members at play. Some of the hospitals might, depending on the level of interaction between us and the hospitals, they might not be there to watch your team every day, but you can gain insights from the perception they get. Some clients also might, because don't forget, it's our ability to work together as a cohesive team that delivers the experience we're looking for. We have a head of provider services whose focus is the hospitals and getting the hospitals to look right. We have client service, customer service, Jaya. We have you selling and prospecting and making all the promises. If all the three, and then we have Dr. OK in claims, processing and you know, keeping our promise of the turnaround time within which we will pay claims. If all these are not in sync, the stakeholders that we engage with will know there's something funny about that even. When they were marketing us, this is what they said. Oh. This is what they said. But by the time they, we had this problem and their head of customer services came, that one said we shouldn't mind sales. That's how they go about lying all the time, that that head of sales doesn't even know what she's doing. You won't know it. Thankfully, we don't have that. <laughs> but you know, I've worked in organizations before where that's how you get to know that your team is so divisive. So your team is completely not, you know, not together. It's from outside. Because they'd say things about each other to external people. But those external people might not tell you if you don't ask them. You know? So, I don't know, Kenny. But yeah, I mean, if you are also looking for feedback on one by, you know, on individual members of your team, it's good to ask the other members of the team. And it's good to also be upfront that you are asking. So to say, you know, I'm not quite sure that, you know, this aspect of the business is, do you think she has noticed or he has noticed that we have a problem in this area? Oh, yes, I think he has, and he's working to resolve it. Eh, is he? I don't think he fully appreciates. Do you think he fully appreciates what the issues are? Oh, yes, he has, because this, this, and this, and this are the things that he said, and this, and this. Okay, 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 okay. And you think he can handle it? Yes, he can. But how about this, how about that? Ah, I'm not sure he thought about that, too. But I know that if it is brought to his attention, he can handle it. But sometimes you also get feedback that, let me not lie, he's not there, or she's not there. Or actually, you know, if we need to fix that, the strength of that person is in the opposite area. So you need to, I think maybe we need to beef certain areas up, you know? So those kind of discussions have to be an ongoing thing if you want a team that is at the top of their game. And the feedback is not necessarily to make anybody worse off. It's not, it's not even much of necessary. It's not to make anybody worse off. It's to bring out the best in the person and to help the person recognize blind spots and to mitigate that person's blind spots for the sake of the team and the sake of the company. Because, you know, there's just one goal and there's only one enemy and the enemy is outside. Either called Haidia, <laughs> THT, or Aksa Mansa. Those are the only three enemies. <laughs> Gosh, this is tiny, forgive me. So these are potential blind spots, the 20 most common blind spots. Blind spots about oneself. Number one, overestimates his or her strategic abilities. Some leaders are better at operational management and are not so strategic, but they don't recognize that they have that weakness. Because, you know, as a leader, people have to know the areas in which they are strong and the areas in which they are weak. Some people, operational leadership is their core strength. Execution, but not so much on the strategy side. A leader has to be aware where their strengths lie. And some leaders want to be right much more than they want to be effective. So the focus is not necessarily on whatever it takes for us to meet our goals is that I must be seen as the one who knows it all and who gets it right all the time. That's another very common one. Some leaders also fail to balance the what with the how, and these are the leaders that are weak on execution. They know what they want to achieve, 
have no clue how. And whatever house they come up with is definitely not going to achieve the world. But they want to force everything and everyone in the world to conform with their views of how to achieve the world. Another common one. Doesn't see his or her impact on others. We've talked about this. Some leaders also believe the rules don't apply to them. They bend the rules or they will not follow the rules. And honestly, there's so many seemingly great leaders that have this as a blind spot. Liz Armstrong was giving us an example in the room. The cyclist. Who knows him? Tour de France? Drug use? Yes, indeed. Indeed, 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 indeed. He believes the rules didn't matter to him or because he was who he was, he could bend the rules. Then, some leaders also think the present is the past. We talked about Henry Ford. This was the greatest problem Henry Ford had. And that's why we talked about the need for having tigers. Potential blind spots about him. One of the most crucial ones is that some leaders fail to focus their team on a few vital priorities. We call it the needle swingers. Is he going to swing the needle? What are the things that we swing the needle? There's no need to make your team start running around like headless chickens, chasing 15 things, 20 things. Hmm? Yes. The 80-20 rule is there. But also, strategically, you need to understand what are the big initiatives that will matter to you for each financial period. because you can't just wear people out. Now, some other leaders also don't understand how the team operates and how the way they engage with the team affects the operation of the team. So sometimes they work with the team in a, matter, in a manner that actually causes even more division or that reduces the energy instead of increasing energy. They might be right. They give an example of an executive who had come in and had been giving some very huge goals to achieve and yes, part of the problem the team had before was complacency, and it had been brought in in order to re-energize the team and to get the company going in a new direction. Everybody on the team knew that, and they welcomed him to help them to get to where they wanted to go to. And even though he had the right ideas, and he knew what to do, but his way of engaging and communicating was very abrasive. And initially, when he was being told that he wouldn't achieve his objectives because of the impact his kind of interaction was having on the team, he didn't believe it because he said, this is what I have been brought in here to do. But after a while, when he realized that he can still communicate the same thing, but in a more collaborative manner, then he started to see traction and he started to be successful at the goals that he had set out for himself. Some leaders also avoid the tough conversations. They don't like conflict. They walk away from conflict. But conflict is good. There are just some rules about conflict, and we'll discuss a couple of that before I sign off. Some leaders also trust the wrong individuals. This happens very often. You see teams, you see organizations where the leaders, they put their trust in one or two particular people. And that one or two particular people might be the actual people who are sabotaging the leader's ability to achieve the company's goals. Then another leader, you know, another way in which blind spots exist about team is, you know, some leaders don't invest sufficient time in building successors. Maybe they think they're going to live forever or you know, they think nobody else can do it as good as they can. But it's a blind spot as well because anything happens if you have to be out for a month, for a couple of weeks, and nobody else can do anything within the company. That's a terrible blind spot. Coming almost to an end, some leaders fail to capture hearts and minds. That means they don't inspire people. They just give orders and chores. There's no bigger vision that people can get excited about. Yeah. And some leaders, you know, they've lost touch with the shop floor. They don't engage anymore with the actual foot soldiers on the ground doing the work. They don't have an understanding of the kind of challenges that is being faced. And they treat information and opinion as fact. And I mean, I've seen this happen before. Um, I worked on a consulting assignment once for a coffee chain, a cafe chain in London called um, White, what's it called again? Anyway was Australian and New Zealand based. White, flat white was the name of the coffee chain. And I remember when we started working on it, you know, the management told us that, you know, um, a greater percentage of the people who come into their cafes, they are Australians or New Zealanders, and that they're coming for that peculiar 
coffee experience that is, you know, it's, it came from their region and it's this and it's that, blah, 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 blah. And that they, they have a kind of culture, the self culture. They had many, many ideas about who their customers are and, you know, how their customers were, were, were segmented. <laughs> you did the research, it was the complete opposite. They thought their crowd was this bohemian, arty, blah, 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 surfers, da, 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 da. <laughs> their customers were everyday working people. Everyday, normal working people. All those things they had in their head. Psh. So, of course, they had to rethink their strategy for growth. Because they were thinking about opening additional cafes in areas where there was a lot of this kind of population of people that they had in their head constituted their customer base. So oftentimes, a blind spot happens when people treat opinions as facts and don't go to actually acquire the right data to support what they want to do. And sometimes blind spots occurs when people also put their own ambition before the company. Sometimes it's also personal interest. I've been in companies before where the interest of the owners and the board members differed. A company was being considered whether it should be put up for sale. A certain faction wanted to sell. So they were being bullish about growth and acquisition and all of that. A certain faction did not want to sell. So they did their damnest bit to slow everything down so that the company would be undervalued. And the CEO at the point was with the people that did not want to sell. So symbol sales aggression had to be curtailed. And other companies within the industry were growing in leaps and bounds. And this company did not grow in any significant manner for almost two years. That's when the personal agenda or personal ambitions of the leadership is contrary to what's in the best interest of the company. Because by the time all of that was then over, it was impossible to catch up with competitors. Two years, competitors were gone. Okay. Um, we've talked about clinging to the status quo, underestimating competitors, and sometimes being overly optimistic. Again, this is actually in the book, so um, it's worth investing in. Why are blind spots, how come they even exist, and what makes them tenacious? They just keep occurring again and again and again. And why do they even come up in the first place? Well, these are the reasons. Sometimes it's an experience gap. People in the financial services sector are very familiar with this. A person has bringing in lots of deposits, bringing in all kinds of things, you know, is a heavy contributor to the deposit drive, and the person keeps getting promoted. No leadership experience. Very little or poor supervisory experience. The a lone ranger who just happens to have connections to bring in deposits. That person's blind spot will be as big as anything. No matter how much coaching you give, you can't take away the fact that there are experience gaps. Now, there's also information overload. Sometimes, in some organizations or in some situations, when people have too much information that they are unable to process, they revert back to what they know and that has never failed them before. No matter what the situation is, no matter how similar or dissimilar the situation is from where they're coming from, once there's information overload, they revert back to instinct and they're unable to process it. There's emotional bias, which all of us have and we all have to be conscious of. Because emotional bias will create blind spots and will also amplify the effect of blind spots. Who wants to hazard a guess and give an example of emotional bias and how that could lead to a blind spot? Emotional bias, I think, relates to, you know, you mentioned triggers. When yes. you get into uh, an environment where you see one or two or three people mm -hmm. that are trigger points for you, uh, it's an emotional bias you have. Yes. It gives us those people who react negatively. Okay. That's another way to think about it. But um, in terms of decision making, 
um, an example I would like to give. Because sometimes what causes the triggers might not necessarily be emotional bias. It's just um, because your village people are not necessarily there. <laughs> and it's the village people that I said are triggering. So I'm, I'm trying to contextualize. I'll come back to the example you gave. But the example that came through most strongly in the book was, so for instance, you know, you've built this company. And in building the company, maybe there were certain, let me use Avon again as an example, hypothetically. So maybe there were certain hospitals that were very supportive in the beginning. And as time passed, these hospitals became careless and negligent okay. in the way they offer services. Maybe the original owner who was even there has moved on and you know, sold it, or maybe the son is now running it. You know that this hospital is a problem. It should be listed. Mm. But your emotions get in the way of you being able to take the right decisions. So some people's emotional, like this one now, it will be loyalty, because maybe in the beginning, this was a hospital, no matter what we did or who we owed or whether we had money to pay, they would always treat patients. So the loyalty you still have at the back of your mind for how that hospital stood by you prevents you from acknowledging the kind of threat they now pose to you as a company. That's an emotional bias. I have another example of an emotional bias. So let's assume you're a new employee that just joined an organization. And there's a certain employee that has helped you to onboard. So let's assume yes. that employee is reporting to you. And over time, you find that this employee's performance has started to dwindle. Now, because you're emotionally drawn to this person who has helped you stabilize, you know, you tend not to um, want to rate them as an only performer. You know, so that's a bias. It's true. Another bias is that, you know, um, I like certain, let's assume I like certain type of people who have strong drive for results. So when I'm recruiting or I'm interviewing, yes. right, I start to look for those type of people who are like me, you know, a prototype. You know, and, and to form a team, you need diversity. Thank you. So you find that you have, your, your team is skewed to a certain type of people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually a good example. And it's one of the ones that um, was also brought to my notice early on in my career. You know, that I had a propensity to hire people who were too much like me. And as you can imagine, mixed for sparks. <laughs> but, um, and not just too much like me in terms of temperament, but also like me in terms of look. And as I kind of matured in this, on this leadership journey, I began to see even beyond what I had been told and recognize other areas within myself. So over time, one has to learn that, you know, that emotional bias is there. And you have to be very mindful of what your emotional biases are. Because once I knew that I had a tendency to hire people who were like myself and recognized the dangers that that presented, then I went out of my way to look for people who were not like me. Dr. Okay is nothing like me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. The thing about these blind spots is that they just need for one to be conscious of them. Positive side. Another side perhaps could be, let's say you've had the staff who maybe had some performance issues or something, or has done something that has not... So you have that, so they call it negative emotional oh, yes. bias. Oh, yes, okay. it happens, so yes. You know what they call, they, they tell you, give a dog a bad name and so hang it. it. Yes. So no matter what the person does after, true. you just don't see No, no, yes, absolutely spot good. on. Yeah. You're spot on, and that's actually also as common. The person has had one or two bad experiences in the past. The person has gone beyond it. But in your mind, all you remember is that this person dropped the ball that time. This person will always drop the ball. And actually, leaders are common. Of, they're, they're very, that's a very common blind spot with leaders. You know, so this is saying that you need to be conscious that your emotional bias can be a positive and it can be a negative. And you need to look out for both types. <laughs> in fact, um, I remember when we started in Avon, the call center manager we had 
looked unlike anybody I had ever hired. I had to convince her to, to let me hire the girl. I need diversity. Her hair was purple, <laughs> purple glasses, <laughs> colored contacts. Colored contacts. <laughs> well, maybe she was branding herself. <laughs> you know, so, um, but what, what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to also understand is that such people are expressing themselves, and that means that the way they come at issues are going to be different as well. And there's value in that. They will see things, you're normal looking, not that they are abnormal looking. They will see things, you know, the kind of people you are used to engaging with will not see, and they'll come at it from a different direction. So the thing to remember is that we, we all have it, and we can have it for negative, we can have it for positive. Each person should recognize their own and be on guard against it. The next is cognitive dissonance. Wow. Who's going to help me to break this down now? Because even me is... Um... Oh, yeah. Try. So, this is school, though. So, just... No, and it's undergraduate school. <laughs> so, cognitive dissonance um, arises when you've been brought up to have a certain faith or belief in something. Then, in your real life, you are now faced with something that is totally opposite to it. It's actually very, very serious in psychology. It can actually result in mental breakdown or a total dissolution. If an example they gave us, I remember clearly two examples back then. One, they talked about um, marriage, right? So you go into a marriage and okay, you, there's ex no certain expectations around marriage. One of them, for some reason in Nigeria, one of them is you must born 10 children. One of them. Then you know, a person comes to tell you, Actually, I don't believe in children. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, I don't believe. We will not do. Uh, forget about it. He said, okay, that will, because it's affecting the fundamental upon which you went into a contract, even though you didn't discuss it. Second one they discussed was religion, actually. And they used an example of saying that's why some people who are deeply religious, not spiritual, no difference, mm -hmm deeply religious, they find that if they go into a certain environment and they are unable to align their religious beliefs, beliefs with what the organization or the environment holds, it causes problem. And coincidentally, my very first job, I saw this on the religious side. I was working in a stockbroking firm as a jobber. And my operations manager was a very, I think it was deeper life then. And he would not counsel people so he would discourage purchase of BAT stock. Um, you know, and BAT Nigerian breweries. And interestingly enough, exactly, in fact, it was so bad that people want to react. What they call that? Dividend warrant. You want to steal ones. You want to, whatever they call the word, dead. Mm -hmm. Invalidate the dividend warrant. There will be an excuse hmm. on why we will not take it in there. Eventually, the MD fired him. <laughs> at the end of the day, because there was a total dissonance between his personal belief system and his the organization values. Sorry, yeah. like I said, it's from school. No, 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 so. it's, it's quite near it enough, because I mean, I, I, I couldn't really think of examples to make it real. I know it's when your core belief and how you think life should be is affecting your ability to fully function as a capable leader in certain situations. You know, and uh, I was trying to bring it home, but I, 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 but that example actually brings it home quite well. I couldn't see any in my own life. That means, uh, thankfully, this hasn't been one of my own areas. <laughs> <laughs> so misaligned incentives is another one, and this, 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 this happens all the time as well. A lot of the time in companies where leaders unknowingly are rewarding the wrong behaviors. So you want long-term growth, but you have designed your incentive for short-term profitability, you know? Or you want short-term profitability, and you want a steep jump, but your incentive has been the kind that, you know, you'll best say, how do we say it in English? Ogota, ogota, wala, So whether people, whether the shop sells or the shop sell, doesn't sell, the person that carries load in the market will collect his fare. Yes, so you, you are the owner of a shop. 
your, your shop sells, your west sells, or your west doesn't sell. The Allah Baru that carried your load for you will collect his own money. So that kind of incentive structure. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, you as a leader are aiming for rapid growth within a short possible time. So that's an example of misaligned incentives and the way it can you know, lead to tenacious blind spots. Then hierarchical distortions we've just talked about, about the JP Morgan case, where you have different layers of hierarchy. And what happens is that as information is getting passed on, what the leader at the top finally hears is a distortion of what the truth is, or very, very far from what the truth is. Another one is overconfidence, and that's tied to complacency also, because if you've been successful in the past, the tendency is for you to assume that you will always be successful, and that what has worked before will continue to work. How do you overcome blind spots? See it for yourself. Every leader has to take the decision to step down and engage. You can't always rely on information that is brought up to you. It's normal that we have roles, responsibilities, and levels, and that we should be able to rely on structures we have put in place, and that you know team members will do what they need to do but there are times you just, as a leader, have to see it for yourself. And every leader has to incorporate that into their everyday leadership style. Moments of one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one engagement with different aspects of the business in a way that helps to confirm what they believe to be true or opens their eyes to what they never knew existed. Actually, any leader that doesn't do this is really, really just setting himself or herself up for failure. Seek out disconfirming data. Oftentimes, leaders will only seek out data that confirms the direction in which they want to go. Maybe my legal training also helped with this one. Because really, for everything, the requirement is that you have to think of why we should not do it. So there will always be two teams. Team one, why should we go this direction? Team two, why should we not go this direction? Team three, in fact, none of the first two. Because our natural inclination is to want to support and affirm a position we have already taken. So a way of overcoming the blind spots associated with doing that is to always have the devil's, what do we call it again? Thank you. Yes, always. Then you need to develop peripheral vision. We can't put blinkers on. Even things that seem relatively unconnected, disconnected, irrelevant, Sometimes just assume that they are. You need to be able to know and to see what is going on, not just on your lane, but on the other lanes to the left and to the right. Because information on a narrow path is always limited and will always give you a limited perspective. The next is you find trusted advisors at every level and at every stage that you can seek feedback on. And the final is that you promote productive fights. That is the breakdown of promoting productive right fights. The first is to hire a team of smart, diverse, and passionate people. <laughs> people who you know, they feel just as strongly about their own opinions, their own skills, their own insightfulness as you. It's their area. And who you know can put up as good a fight as the next person when it comes to what they want to do or what they believe the company should do to get them to the next level in their own area. The next is something that had come up before, which is you've got to focus them on a few vital priorities. The, one of the most important responsibilities of a leader is to bring preciseness 
and structure and order into a chaotic, ambiguous world. Because it's very easy for people to chase many, 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 many things. And energy gets diffused. People get discouraged. People get overwhelmed. But when you focus everybody's effort on a few vital priorities, then the energies are better used. This says embrace high-level conflicts and show low-level conflicts. I'm going to talk a bit about conflicts in the workplace. You know, in encouraging conflict, once you have an agreement on where you are going, you can and should encourage conflict on the routes you will take to get there. So those kind of so-called high-level conflicts are good. Conflicts that are arising from a difference of opinion as to time of execution, mode of execution, depth of execution, all those things are good. The kind of conflicts you want to avoid and you want to seek that you don't have are conflicts that are rooted in deep personality differences. Ideological conflicts. Or conflicts that arise because people have perceptions about each other. Those are the conflicts you don't want to give room for. And always establish ground rules for having productive fights. So like I said, maybe I remember when NHIS wanted to do this mobile health thing that didn't get anywhere. And um, we were asked to pay six million, which was a lot of money then. We just started, we're only in our second year or so. And then some other money is on a monthly basis for us to participate as an HMO unit. Personally, I'd looked at it, and I didn't think it was worth us paying us the money. But I said, it's too big a decision for me to take a loan and just say that's what we're going to do. And besides, I also acknowledged to myself I didn't have all the facts. I hadn't analyzed all the different perspectives that were possible. So we went off site for about two days, split ourselves into three teams. The team that was for against it, the team that was for us participating, and then a team that, yes, we could participate, but we will make changes and suggestions. And for about two days, they were talking, analyzing, presenting perspectives. At the end of that exercise, we concluded that we wouldn't do it. Time proved us to be right. All the HMOs that did it never got anything out of it. But there were also ground rules then that we said. So we had ground rules about if you were saying we should do it or we should not do it, you know, you had to back it up with what would be the final financial implication. How were we going to make money? When were we going to make money? There are all kinds of things that we did then. So I can't remember all the details, but all I know is that, you know, in productive fights, there has to be ground rules that everybody will adhere to. There's some unspoken ground rules anyway, like you can't get personal and call people names. You can't attack people's own, you know, psyche or anything about them on a personal level. Family is off limits. I mean, there's just some ground rules that everybody in the work environment will take for granted. But I guess this talks about going a level higher and establishing ground rules for the times when you really want robust discussions and strong differing opinions to be brought to fore and um, argued about. The most important is when all, in fact, the chairman says this all the time. After all is said and done, and we said this is where we're going. Only one voice for execution. There's no more room for a difference of opinion. There's no more room for anything. If we've agreed it, you go with your full heart and your soul, and you go and execute. At this juncture, I just want us all to remember this. Uh, we all know who he is, one of the richest men who built America. And what he says is that credit must go to those who are willing to enter the leadership arena. 
and in so doing, potentially exposing their weaknesses and shortcomings in the pursuit of a larger and often sometimes noble cause. Because many people get the opportunity to be leaders, but they don't take it. It takes bravery because when you are a leader, your successes, yes, they might be amplified, but so are your failures. You are up on stage, everybody can see you. So in as much as we've discussed blind spots, and in as much as many people here will not only see their blind spots, they will see, ah, I have not told you about my own blind spots openly. So. <laughs> but some other people will also see the blind spots of their own leaders. Let us be compassionate in the way we draw attention to them. Let us keep it at the back of our minds that what they're also doing takes a lot of courage. Self-awareness is actually a painful process and it needs compassion to produce the right results. So thank you all very much. Wow, fantastic presentation. Simba, please sit over there. Thank you very much, Simba. Okay, we have about five minutes to go. We would like to debate this a little more. Sure. So I'd like to invite our moderator for today, Mr. Jibuno. Please, can you join Simba on stage? Um, so Adim would help with the Q&A session and um, he would stir the conversation um, a bit more about leadership. So over to you, sir. <laughs> um, Simba, that was um, a very incisive uh, delivery. Thank you. Well done again. Um, one question that I would like to ask before opening the floor for the audience is uh, you mentioned that you know after five years you still found some of those the tenacity of those blind spots reoccurring again and um, I'm sure you still see some of them even today uh, the question is why do they never get extinguished the simple reason is that these weak spots are also your greatest strengths. Remember that's what we said in the beginning. So you need to manage. You, need, you will never get rid of those because you lose the core essence of who you are. And what makes you successful is inevitably tied down to that. But you've got to work with them in a way that takes cognizance of the threat they present to your success. So the key thing is working with them in a way that makes their threat to your success be minimized. They're never going to go away. You minimize the threat they pose to your failures, to your success. Okay, success. Okay. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you have any experiences, questions, problems, challenges that blind spots may have thrown up in the past in your respective um, work careers that you want to share or you want how to elucidate more on uh, you can please ask one is there any other last speaker okay simple um, my question is this so um in the span of my career, um, I've always had this perceived blind spot I sort of look at. And what it basically has been is when I have a major project to deliver, I'm so focused and passionate at it that I sort of overlook every other thing till I execute and I'm done with this project. Now, for me, I know at the point where I'm trying to close this project, in most cases, I'm overlooking the others, right? To people external of my team and of my business, they see me as a person that, that, that they say, this guy executes and he makes sure he closes. To myself, I see it as a blind spot. Once I'm focused on it, I lose sight of every other deliverable I have, right? So how does one balance this? Yeah, that's a serious blind spot, you're right. And it's um, for you to continue evolving as a leader, there are certain things I can say you should try and consciously put in place. 
when you have a project like that, what you can do is to rigorously allocate yourself. So for instance, you know you have this project to deliver. Maybe it's a project that you have planned is going to take over the next four weeks. You articulate all the other deliverables you have to deliver in addition to that project. And you make a plan allocating yourself. So the key point is to, from the very beginning, plan for all the things you need to do to make your project successful by the due date but also all the things you need to do to deliver on those deliverables that have been expected of you. If you don't have a total picture of that ab initio, that means from the beginning, there's a greater likelihood you will chase that project and leave everything else. But if you have an idea of what it's going to take for you to deliver on that project, and you've allocated your time, your resources, to that project, even if that project is going to take 70%, and you allocate another I don't know, 30%, 25%, 40% to your other deliverables, then you stand a certain chance, sorry, a more certain um, likelihood of achieving all and not dropping on your other deliverables. I think the challenge that most, that, that tends to happen mostly is that most people have not developed the discipline of breaking down what it takes to achieve success on everything they are responsible for within the certain timeline. And that is, that is, the, one, that is the one thing that, that really, really does help. From the beginning, identify, OK, this is the project I need to do. These are the things I need to do in order to be, you don't have to actually articulate what your road to success is and what it will take of your time. Because the time is the, really the resource that you have that you are allocating across all, all these various things. Has that helped? Okay, Simba, just another teaser, you know, for our millennials who are here, who have not probably gone through a lot of uh, leadership experiences and see uh, the triggers of blind spots come up in their respective careers, what advice will you have for them to proactively place them in a position where they can spot those things and become aware of them early enough and begin to deal with them early enough in their careers? Okay. Wow, um, you know, one of the greatest favors that we can do for ourselves in the very early stage of our careers is to be very open to criticism. I discovered that, you know, there's a tendency for people just coming up to justify. Yes. You know, a certain unwillingness to take on board observations, feedback, and so it, it, so, so, so I know, I'm sorry guys, I'm telling you the truth. I want you guys to rule the world. You know, and because there are other sources of achievement that are tangible, they wave those ones away. They don't pay attention to those ones. Because the other sources of achievement, the other examples of achievement that are tangible is enough to make them feel good and ignore all the others. But those others, when attention is not paid to them, at the Achilles heel, that then ends up being an obstacle. And I'll, I'll share some really personal stories. So I have two friends who are in their late 40s now, and their career has kind of come to a halt. And we were discussing yesterday, myself and another mutual friend of these two ladies. And what we said, one of us, one of the two ladies, I say one of us because we're all friends, we left this university around the same time. She had a real problem conforming to authority and accepting authority. Very brilliant very creative. Everywhere she worked, people loved her. But her problem was that she couldn't bear being corrected, being spoken to. She couldn't bear the thought of anybody having authority over her. So it made her very unstable. She'd work a few years here and move on. And after a while, she said she's not even working for anybody anymore. And she never dealt with that. There's some things where you don't deal with it. Even when you set up your own business, it will catch up with you. 
Because if you have a short fuse and you're unable to accept other viewpoints and to accept criticism in a way that, you know, makes you go back and think, it will catch up. And it, it caught up with these two ladies. That was the first person's problem. The other friend, um, how do I describe what her own issue was? She was working and did not take the step to improve herself because she was doing well. So she was working in a firm that was doing well and was paying a lot, but she herself wasn't developing. The more the small company did well, the more she got paid. It was a small oil and gas company. You were like head of admin or something, which didn't mean anything. It's just that you spoke English well. The Oyimbo owners liked you. And they paid you a lot of money. You went developing. So after a while, all service being what it is, small all service firm, they saw other opportunities in other countries that had more oil. Angola was there. Their business in Nigeria, they were giving them too much headache. They shut down Nigeria and moved to Angola. She was unmarketable. What did she know? How she developed herself? Since then, she's been fumbling through, trying to, you know, but she didn't have any really marketable skills that was transferable to other industries or other roles or other work environments. That's another problem that millennials have that they need to be cognizant of now. I think those are, for me, those two examples just... Thank you. Any, um, Atinika? Um, how many minutes do we have? I see we have exhausted our time. So we can wrap up after a couple of questions. So maybe I'll turn at you after you. We can. Okay, okay so maybe one, two, two last questions, please. Yeah, so we can. I, I think people have meetings after six o'clock. Mine is not more, it's not really a question. It's just adding to what Simba said about we, we millennials taking. Uh, Are you <laughs> <laughs> and I have the email link as proof. It starts from 1981. <laughs> okay, so just quickly, um, so adding to what Simba said about millennials being open to crit being open to criticism, I think it's also important that we are true to self because. One thing I have struggled with is, um, is procrastination, and I know that that is a problem I have. So not trying to explain it away or give excuses all the time has helped me. So I know I have that problem. And you, as you said, the flip side is it makes you efficient because you know the things that come with procrastination. You lose confidence. You have so much work to catch up on. You're constantly giving excuses. You do not want to be in that situation. So when things come, I, I know that's a problem and I, I have. So I try to address it so I don't fall back into that pattern. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chinazo, that's the last uh, comment question. Okay, uh, there was a place where you mentioned um, throwing in informal culture. So I just wanted to understand how it would work without actually affecting your normal process or culture that you've built over the years. Okay. So um, an informal culture is part of your culture. Um, so let me give an example. For people that work with me, they know that I always try and say, you know, you guys, you just sit down, eat together, discuss these issues, because I, I, I believe and that some of the greatest ideas we've had have come not from formal meetings or from emails, but from hallway conversations, getting interesting, and we say, OK, you know what? Let's go sit down and discuss this thing. Or conversations where I'm just walking, and I see someone working on something, and I say, hey, I've always thought, why, why does this have to be like this? And da, 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 da. And the person starts saying, actually, listen, but it doesn't have to be. You know, only the other day, Kendi and I were discussing, and we thought that we could do it this other way, blah, 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 but we want to run it by Dr. Okay and see, you know? So that's what I mean by informal culture. A culture where people are not hung on, okay, until the meeting happens, I can't discuss it, or this is my boss, so I must discuss it with my boss before it then goes to the boss of my boss, you know? There has to be some kind of informal culture that allows 
the open and um, free transmission of ideas outside the formal processes that you have. That's what an informal culture means. It must complement your formal structures. You know? Has that helped? Okay. So, so Adim, I think Joseph has a question. Okay. Is it comment? Okay, simple. So this is my last one. Really fast. I'm looking at the whole informal discussions and being able to break that out. So this is a challenge I have currently. And it relates to your stories about your two friends. So you have a millennia who you are trying to engage to close out on, say, a deliverable, a major. And the person always wants to have the last say. The person is headstrong, more like what you said. The person does not want to conform, or the person believes, I have to do it my way. Hmm. How do you deal with that? So in, invariably, I'm saying, if you had the chance to be with those two friends in the same business, how would you have advised them differently before they came to that end? Wow. You know? I'm almost convinced no matter what I said, they were going to do what they wanted to do. As much as I loved them and as much as I wanted the best for them. Because um, at that time, you know, the thing about youth is that when you're young, you tend to have a belief, a positive mindset that things are going to be okay for you and with you. Except you been close to people who have had challenges. You've seen other people's leadership journey. And I think maybe I was kind of lucky in that way. One, I used to read a lot. And I read about failures and I read about successes. So I had a sort of, I don't know, recipe, what's it called again? Yes, of, of what could go wrong in your life if you didn't do things in certain ways and blah, 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 blah. And plus I had a very strict father who you couldn't really mess around with. And so I was used to tight authority and responding well to authority. To an extent, I be adding, to an extent. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 I'm not sure there's anything I could have said to them. And that's why I'm sharing their story now, because what this story is supposed to do for some of the millennials in this room is to help them see whether they see themselves in these two ladies I've described and what they need to do about it. So part of uh, what I would do, if, because don't forget at that time we were age mates. So what could I really tell them that they would believe me? What do you know? <laughs> but now, if I see them in my team, I know the stories to tell them. And my stories have more credibility. Because I've lived far more years than they have, and hopefully they trust me to want the best for them and their future. And to give them advice that will help them get to where they really want to get to. So if I told them then, they wouldn't have believed me because we're the same age and as far as they were concerned, what do I know that they don't? But for a millennial of today, I have plenty of war stories to share, even much more than I shared with you today. And I'm constantly sharing. Constantly. You know, so. It's not a question, but I don't have to say it. Well, let's, let's learn from you. Okay, thanks. It's not a question. It's just something that somebody said to me in class recently, and it's so true. He came into the class and he said, you know, gentlemen and ladies, it doesn't really matter what I say to you. From the beginning of this class to the end, what matters is what you are saying to yourself. Sure. What I have found with a lot of young people, unfortunately, is that... Actually, I'm not even sure advice makes sense, and, and, I'm, and I mean it here. What probably helps is for you to allow them to discover the truth and then guide themselves. It's, advising young people is a waste of time. Just to, I pray for them. I have them in my hands. I pray for them, and then sometimes I let them fall into the thing. And then when they are like, then I call them and then I say, you know, this thing, you know, the reason why it happened was if you had just been a bit patient. But all that talking and talking, you are just aggravating and irritating them. So it's very really funny, but that's the truth. It's what they say to themselves that is going to stay with them and is going to make them change. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to reply to that, honestly, to a large extent, Tony is right. That's why I say I'm not sure what I could have said to my friends could have made a difference. The only thing I would add to that is that 
uh, maybe I shouldn't have used the word advice, is to tell them the implication of the decisions they are taking now and then leave them still to take the decision they want to take. So that's why I say I use stories. Well, you know, if you go this route, this is a likely implication. This is likely going to happen. This is likely going to happen. Because, hey, I have an example for you. This, this, this. And, you know, so you just kind of open their eyes. Decision at the end of the day is always going to be theirs. And that, that's, that's a great thing about being a millennial, I guess, you know. Um, I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't give up. Yes. I'm of the opinion that you would find a leader they trust. And the only way they can trust you is by seeing your life and seeing your example. Yeah. And they'll be drawn to you. Yeah. And when they're drawn to you, that's the opportunity. So if it's one you can you can get. Yes. So every one that you get, you know, you've made a difference. Mm -hmm. So I, I won't give up. No, please, please. <laughs> so much you wanted to say a word. So much you wanted to say a word. That's a real millennial. <laughs> Not the fake at Lucas. <laughs> Um, I no, I was just saying that I think that millennials who realize that they don't know everything and that you mean well for them, yes, they will listen to you. True. So there's a lot of time you, you come across you know advice and then you find it insincere and not genuine, and True. so it's easy to ignore or walk away from it. But then if it's someone that you, you have a good relationship with, and not necessarily even a close, um, intimate relationship with, but somebody who you trust has your best interest at heart, yeah. is not trying to dim your light, is not trying to tear you down, is not trying to set you up, put mm -hmm. you in any trap, but somebody who genuinely looks out for you. If, if they give you, in fact, I'm going to share a story. So last week, I was working with Simba on a project, and she, she you know, it, it was under such a short timeline. And you know, she said, so much, I like working with you because you're brilliant, but I have to tell you something. You must realize that not everybody will get things very quickly. Not everybody would you know, see the picture as you see it, and you need to be a little more patient. You need to calm down a little and understand that everybody will get there eventually, but not at the same time. You need to recognize that now. And she told me that, and I took a step back, and I said, this is actually true. Because many times, you're rushing under tight constraints, and you're saying, come on, come on, don't you see? We need to submit this. But then she said, you know, you have a bright future, everything, but you need to take this seriously. And I, I've known Antimo for that, that long a period. I mean, we've only had two or three close meetings so far. But I know that, ultimately, she's looking out for me. And so I will never lose sight of that advice, ever. And it's something that I'm now. Um, implementing and taking exactly take exactly more conscious about it so in the few weeks since then so so please keep advising us and okay. we'll listen. <laughs> thank you okay lola lola sorry i i just think there's something to be said about your about experiencing it for yourself um maybe not necessarily in the works workplace but um I, I almost fully co-signed to what um, Twain Sani said. So um, my own personal experience is uh, my little brother, who is not that little. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we, we um, had a very, if I want to chart like our life experience is very, very similar. We went to the same schools. At some point we were taking the same classes and I'd be like, look, you just have to attend this class. And they will pass you, you know? And um, it didn't matter what I said. And he trusted me. My brother trusts me wholeheartedly. Let's just say it didn't go, go. We didn't go the same way. And if you talk about, you know, whether or not people are formed by their experiences, you know, or you know, whatever. Um, very similar experiences, but he just, you know. But today, there's a sense of ownership in where he is and what he's doing because he experienced it on his own and he figured it out. I think all you, you can do is you can give that advice, you can pray, mm -hmm. um, and just, no, no, seriously, you should give that advice and pray, but you know what, people, I think at the end of the day, because if, especially if you know like deep down what's inside them, that they don't want to fail, um, hold out hope, they will eventually figure it out, but there's something really to be said about you figuring it out on your own, because when you have that thing that you built for yourself, 
there's nothing anybody else can tell you um, yeah. about it. And, you, and then, you know, hopefully you can also share that experience. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's our you know. personal journeys and the failures. I mean, I've, I've just shared some of my worst experiences with you. And um, th th this are uh, what makes, um, what gives credence to when we share these experiences, maybe to give advice and to also, you know, help younger people. And I guess maybe they can sense the authenticity in what you're saying. Because if you have not been there before and you try and talk about it, you know, it, it might come up really, really fake. You know, it takes one who has been there and who has maybe walked the same path to you know, convey that. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. Toyu is right. Some people, no matter what you say, it's not going to work. You, you know, pray for them. But I am um, the same school of thought with Mudupe. We keep praying and we keep sharing what we know and hoping that maybe out of 10, two will pick it, three might pick it, five might do, four might do. But I also, you know, um, concur that there has to be a certain level of trust and, and believe that the person who is speaking with you is actually, you know, out for your best interest for, for, for that to work. So thank you all very much. Okay. Yeah, okay. Ian, I told you Ian I wanted to say something. Oh, yeah, you know you raised your hand. <laughs> I told you I saw your hand raised. <laughs> well, if uh, Atineke is a millennial, I'm also... <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think before I, I give the... I think before we, I give the mic to HR, uh, um, Olamide, uh, Simbo, I just want to thank you. Um, you will all agree that we've learned one or two things here today. I have. And um, I want to thank you for the um, eloquence, the clarity of your delivery, um, in fact, the decorum of your delivery. I think it was um, exciting, interesting, and um, the onus is on all on all of us to kind of like learn, um, do a personal, um, um, what did you call it again, visit on ourselves to ascertain what our blind spots are. Reach out for people who can speak to us honestly about it and see how we can improve on ourselves. Uh, at the end of the day, we want leaders who can inspire and cause us to achieve the overall goal and objectives. Thank you again, Simba. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Simbo, for this insightful presentation. Um, I join Adim in thanking you very, 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 very much. Um, can we please appreciate Simbo, please? Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, see you next month. <laughs> Thank you. No refreshments or what? No, unfortunately, no refreshments today. It's a Tuesday, so. Let's work together, please. You know you sent a mail. You sent a mail.